Good morning, Anchor Church. Everybody doing good this morning? Awesome. It is great to see you. It is great to be here. Love your new digs. This is cool. Saw the kids' space earlier today. What what an awesome blessing and uh, just a great joy to be with you in this new location. Sure grateful for your pastors and uh, the investment that they have made in this fellowship and its purpose over all the years. Grateful to see what God is doing. I, I confess a little disappointment in myself this morning as we walked out of the house yesterday to head this direction. I said to my wife, I should take my sneakers, my, my new Nikes. I should take those down. And then I walked out the door and forgot about them. And I got here this morning, I pulled it, and I realized the black and the blue in your logo matches my sneakers. Man, I missed them. What an, and then I was doubly disappointed when I saw what Pastor Alex is wearing. Those are sweet, dude. Those are awesome. So I'm going to start a, I know there's this preacher sneakers thing and all that stuff, but I think I'm going to, I preach in churches all across Kansas, and I'm going to start a little chart that shows who wears the really cool, yeah, so anyway. Well, it's just great to be here. We get to talk this morning about honor. Honor up, honor down, honor all around. And uh, as you might guess, I'm going to say some pretty specific things about honor before we're done this morning, and most specifically about the challenge of giving honor when you're not sure that honor is due. Giving honor when you're reluctant, when you don't want to, when everything about you says, this, this, this person doesn't deserve any honor. We're going to talk about what to do in those situations, but I would like it if we could begin by just laying a foundation regarding what I think will be a mutually agreeable premise that the world is a better place filled with honor. The world is a better place filled with honor. And, and, and if, I, you know, if there's any doubt in your heart about that, I would just invite you to think about a world where honor is absent. A world where what exists, in fact, is the opposite, is, is dishonor, is disrespect, is, is denigration. Some of you know what it's like to live in a place like that. Because maybe you came up as part of a, a dysfunctional family where honor was never extended. Maybe you've been employed in a, in a miserable workplace where the, where the possibility of honor was just unthinkable. Maybe, maybe you're employed in that kind of place now, right? We'll talk about that in a second as we move on, right? Maybe, maybe you faced a, a similar challenge in your neighborhood or in your classroom or, a, or, or maybe even in some church you've been a part of over your lifetime. What could be worse? I mean, think about this. What could be worse than living in a world where all you know, where all you've experienced is not the honor you deserve but the dishonor that you despise? Any world you can imagine is better filled with honor. Indeed, the, the richer, the, the thicker, the more pervasive the honor that fills the atmosphere, the better the world. It's like getting extra icing on your cinnamon roll. Come on, is there anything better than that? Any fans of some good iced up cinnamon rolls in the house this morning, right? Is there anything better than that? Where honor abounds, where honor abounds, marriages are better and families are better and, and neighborhoods are better and cities are better and jobs are better and businesses are better. Churches are better. Preachers preach better. People do better. And here's why. Because our God, who is a God of lavish, abundant, extravagant honor, created this world to function, created this world to thrive, created this world to flourish with honor. He created us and our world as a reflection of who he is. Of course it functions better, full of honor. You heard it expressed last week, we were made for honor. We were made to pour out honor. We were made, yes, even to receive honor, to know and to give honor on every level, honoring up, right, to those who are over us in authority, whether that's an employer or a parent or a, or a leader, and certainly God himself, and honoring down to those who may serve under our authority, to those we lead, to those we mentor, I would say to those who 
carry places of service or maybe even common labor in our culture, in our world. Human beings, human, this is a little bit of a hobby horse for me, all right, but human beings who are far too often disparaged and disregarded in our world and we put them at a lower place because they don't have maybe the education or the employment or the, or the culture that we think we're so blessed with. Honoring what our culture then thinks of as honoring down. It's not honoring down. It's really honoring all around because we're celebrating the inherent worth of peers and colleagues and family and friends. And we are embracing the biblical reality that every person who we encounter, every person who we encounter is someone formed in the image of God, valued at the cost of Christ's life and worthy of love and service. In fact, I want to just offer that as a working definition of honor this morning. Honor is recognizing that every person with whom you interact is formed in the image of God, is valued by Christ at the cost of his life, and is worthy of love and service. Every person. And if that's going to happen, if we're going to build, help to build, if we're going to help to create in partnership with God the best possible world, which is what we're called to, by the way. The world shouldn't be worse because we're here. It should be better. If we're going to build the best possible world, honor then starts with us. It starts with the people of God, with with our hearts and with our minds and with how we think about and, and as a result, how we treat all others. I mean, where else? Please, if the world is going to get better, where else could it possibly start? Where else is it going to start? With with whom else? Is that the proper grammar? With, with, with whom else? With whatever, with what other body of people could it possibly start than those who have been abundantly, overwhelmingly, wonderfully treated as honorable by Jesus himself? And so we honor first. We don't wait for somebody else. We honor freely. We don't wait to be constrained upon to to, to extend honor. We honor fully. We pour it out like we're just loaded with it to give. Well, here's the deal about that. First of all, we're all agreed then that the world is a better place full of honor, right? We're all agreed that it starts with the people of God, yes? Here's the thing about that. That's easy to do as long as we like the people we're called to honor. It's easy to do as long as the people that we are seeking to honor think like us and look like us and talk like us and dress like us and worship like us and vote like us and live like us. But the further that we move away from similarities like that, the further that we live away, move away from, from familiarity like that, the more difficult honor becomes. The more distant and and distinct our worldviews and our opinions and our convictions and and things we're just so sure are so, the the, the, the more distant those things become from those we need to honor, the more difficult then extending honor to someone who thinks differently, who acts differently, who believes differently becomes. That's true culturally, right? That's true even geographically. It's certainly true if you're distant from me relationally. The further that we are distanced relationally from someone we love, who looks like us, thinks like us, acts like us, as opposed to someone we don't know and maybe will never meet, who who looks, thinks, and acts nothing like us and maybe even stands in disagreement with us, maybe even even, uh, puts themselves or has a position where they might damage us or bring harm to us, the more difficult, the more that distance grows, the more difficult extending honor becomes. So how do you honor when you disagree? How do you honor when you dislike? How, how, do I really have to? Am I, am I really expected to honor someone I'd rather not? I really expected to honor, I'm just thinking today about a, I don't know why this popped in my head, maybe this is the Lord, the parent at the ball game when their kid is, you know, they don't like the ump, just keeping it real. 
Am I really expected to honor someone I don't like, someone I don't agree with, maybe even someone I would just as soon have nothing to do with? What's my obligation? The, the startling biblical answer to that question is yes. Yes. In the most amazing ways, yes. Re- regardless of differences, yes. Regardless of distance, regardless of whether I like or dislike, the Bible still calls us to honor, think about this, everyone. Everyone. Fascinating passage of Scripture in 1 Peter chapter 2. And if you've got your Bible or it's on your device, I invite you to open there with me. We'll start with verse 13 in a little bit. But 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter is written to first century believers who are living in a world where, where really they don't fit in. Where there are plenty of people different from, plenty of people different from them, plenty of people that, that they could have issues with, so much so that the Apostle Peter addresses them as strangers, addresses them as aliens, not from another planet, aliens with buggy eyes and green skin, right? But aliens in that, aliens in that their citizenship is in heaven. And their attitudes and their actions and their behaviors are to be aligned with the king of that place and not the wickedness that rules this place. And Peter writes to these believers as they endure a season of increasing persecution. And all they're trying trying to do is live righteously. All they're trying to do is is love Jesus and and do what's right, but it's getting tougher and tougher and tougher to do that. And to these believers, these displaced, out of place in a broken world believers, Peter says, 1 Peter 2, verse 13, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme, or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For it is the will of God that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for sin or evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God, honor the emperor. Verse 17 is going to be our focus in a little bit, but I just want to highlight a few things before we get there that kind of sets that up, that that captures the heart. Verse 13, be subject for the Lord's sake to every, everybody say every, every human institution. So nothing gets left out. You, you don't get to choose, I'll agree with this, so I'll, so I'll be subject here, but I think that's absurdly bogus, so not on my watch, right? You are, you, in contrast to that kind of an attitude, you are willingly submitting to those who are in authority over you for the sake of the calling and cause of Jesus Christ. Verse 14, it doesn't matter whether it's the emperor himself or some intermediate representative of the emperor, they all get respect. Say, what's that got to do with me? Well, if you're one of these asked to see the manager every time you're upset about something, (laughs) I'm just saying, while you're nothing but a pain in the neck to the person who's working the counter, maybe there's a word here for you. Stop it. Whoo! Because, because, verse 15, the will of God, the will of God, oh, Jesus, what's your will for my life? The will of God is that not through your protests and not through your demands and not through your obnoxious arguments, but by doing good, by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. I just think about this from time to time. How unstoppable, how unstoppable would the work of God be if the people of God simply did good and nothing else? If we simply did what was pure and good, what kind of impact would that carry in our world? 
live in the freedom that's yours, verse 16, to live as a servant of God, right? Not to cover up evil, but to, freedom is not the capacity to do whatever you want, wherever you want, liberated from any concern or any consequence about your actions. Freedom, rather, is the liberty of that to live as you were formed to live, to live as you were redeemed to live, to the glory of God, your King. So all that sets up then this crazy verse, 17, honor everyone, everyone, right? Love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Honor, we're going to focus on those first two words in a little bit, honor everyone, but I, I just love, I want to say that I love that Peter closes this paragraph with a challenge to these first century believers to honor the emperor. Nobody, it seemed, had more power to destroy these believers than the emperor. Indeed, probably, Peter wrote this command just as the persecution of Christians under Nero was, was ramping up. So I want you to think about the worst nightmare you can imagine in governmental leadership. I want you to think about the worst nightmare. And all you got to do is think about which if the election goes the way you don't want it to go. That's what everybody thinks. This is the worst possible turn of events. How could, we, how could that possibly be helpful, right? Think of your worst nightmare in governmental leadership. And it's like Peter says, honor everyone, love the brother and fear God. Oh, no, 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 I mean everyone. Honor the, honor the emperor. Honor the emperor. That guy you've got the reason to despise the most. The person you have the reason to despise the most, honor the emperor. It raises again the question of what that looks like. How do we honor those with whom we disagree? How do we honor those who stand opposed to us? How do we honor those who even potentially threaten harm against us? Because the command itself is pretty straightforward. Honor everyone. I don't see any loopholes. I, I don't see much in the way of work around there. I, I, well, in the original Greek, blah, blah. No, honor everyone. There it is, right? How do I honor everyone, even people I don't like, even people who don't like me, even the person who cuts me off when I'm heading down Clinton Parkway? Because some of you are going to get tested on this yet today. You know that, right? Honor everyone. Peter doesn't do us the courtesy of expounding on that here in this verse, but I have been pondering this week what I think is a, a biblical telling example of honoring those with whom we disagree, maybe even honoring those who we'd say don't deserve honor. And I think a great example of this is found in the, in the story of the Old Testament prophet Daniel. I'm supposing that you know Daniel's story. He's an Israelite, a Jew. His nation, Judah, has been conquered by the Babylonians, and King Nebuchadnezzar has deported from Judah to Babylon the best and the brightest of that land, and Daniel is among those who's deported. And he finds himself in Babylon being subject to an immediate period of indoctrination by what is to him a foreign government, and not just any foreign government, but the government that just defeated and destroyed his land, his nation, his homeland. And now, as a part of this indoctrination process, Daniel and his companions, and you probably know these names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel and his companions are supposed to be indoctrinated into things Babylonian, and part of that indoctrination includes the embrace of a Babylonian diet. All the richest foods from the king's table, right? It's, it's like the, I mean, it's a, it sounds like a wonderful opportunity. It's like the chance to eat an NFL training camp. Just load me up, you know. Give me the best of the best. But the diet isn't kosher. It doesn't meet the dietary restrictions of the Mosaic covenant, this covenant that God made with Moses and Israel at Mount Sinai. And so here's the point of all this. In an honorable way, in an honorable way, Daniel offers an appeal with someone with whom he disagrees in authority over him. 
he asks the chief official over him for permission to forego the prescribed diet. This is all in Daniel chapter 1. If you don't know the story, you can read it this afternoon. He just simply says, could the, could the four of us, me and my bros, right, could the four of us skip the defiling food, we'll just eat the vegetables and drink water. And the official pushes back. I can't have you on a diet like that because you'll be looking all scraggly and puny in no time and it'll be my head that gets lost as a result, right? My head will be on the chopping block. You're not the one at risk here. I'm the one at risk here. And so Daniel refines the appeal. Daniel chapter 1 verse 12. Please test your servants for 12 days. 10 days. 10, 12. What? Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. And then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. Probably know what happens at the end of 10 days, verse 15. At the end of 10 days, these four, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. It's a great story. It's a simple story. But I don't want to overlook how skillfully Daniel navigated this situation with honor towards, towards those in authority over him, honor with those towards whom or with whom he disagreed. He could have adopted an entirely different attitude, and some of us have adopted this attitude. He could have become hateful. He could have become vengeful. He could have become angry. He could have become uncooperative. He could have shook his fist at this captain in charge of him and said, you're not going to treat me that way, and if he had, he'd have been dead. We'd have never known it because he'd have been off the, off, you know, he's off the radar. He's gone. I don't know what happened to Daniel. Disappeared somewhere. Or he could have been passive overly submissive. This is what some of us do. Could have been willing to violate the covenant with God that had shaped the people of God now for centuries, except that we'd have probably never known that either because God wouldn't have been able to bless that disregard for his covenant. And what Daniel understood that made a difference in his ability to be honorable towards those whom, with whom he disagreed is that honor doesn't necessarily require agreement and disagreement doesn't necessarily mean dishonor. And when Daniel continues to honor even when he disagrees, when Daniel continues to honor even when he disagrees, God is able not only to make provision for Daniel but to bless even beyond that. Three ways specifically, real quickly here, that Daniel blesses, that God blesses Daniel as he, as he disagrees with honor. Number one, God granted Daniel divine favor with his overseers. God had caused, verse 9, God had caused the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel. Some of you could use some favor. Some of you in a place where you disagree and, and, you, and, and yet you could use some favor, right? You could use the favor of the Lord in your context. Well, guess what? Maybe, maybe honor has something to do with opening the door of God's favor. You fought with your spouse on the way to church this morning, and you could use a little favor to patch that up again. Jesus, you got to show up in this relationship. What are we going to do? How about honor? You're going to go to work tomorrow and you're going to have a disagreement with your employer, with your boss, with somebody who's got the authority to say, no, do it this way. And you don't think that's the way it ought to be done and you're not sure about that. Maybe with honor, God could grant you a little favor with them. Again, neighborhood, family, church, business, community, whatever it is. When Daniel extended honor even in disagreement. God granted Daniel divine favor with his overseers. Second, God showed up in Daniel's obedience in miraculous ways. He offers this, this, this alternative. He does so with honor, and at the end of the 10 days, Daniel and his, and his homies, they looked healthier, they looked better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. Some of you could use some miraculous in your life. Some of you got a circumstance, a situation, a relationship where if, if God doesn't do something, you don't know how you're going to survive it. Maybe the key is honor. 
Third, God gave Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego divine knowledge and understanding, equipping them to lead in Babylon. To these four young men, verse 17, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand vision and dreams of all kinds. So when Daniel found strength by the grace of God to show honor even in disagreement, Daniel, who really came to to Babylon as a prisoner of war, becomes a leader in the nation of Babylon. You, you do with this metaphor what you want. But some of you feel like you're a prisoner of war when you ought to be leading because God raised you to that place. He, he wants to give you that place. But you're not going to get there as long as you continue to dishonor those who are over you. Because honor matters that much to the king we serve. So I just want to ask you this morning, where, where, where in your world Do you need to replace dishonor, anger, frustration with honor? Where in your world do you need to find the grace to replace passive acceptance with the strength to be able to disagree while still extending honor? What could God do? What could God do if in every relationship you can think of, every encounter you'll have with another human being this week, if you were to to covenant in your heart with God, I'm going to treat people with honor. Nobody said because they deserve it. Guess what? You were honored by Jesus Christ when you didn't deserve it. Ephesians talks about how we were, we were enemies with God. We were destined for destruction because of our attitude towards God, with our rebellion towards God. And every one of us, every one of us knows that at some point in our lives, we've as much as shaken our fist in the face of God and said, I don't need you in my life. I know what I want to do. I don't care what your direction says. I'm going my way, dishonoring the God of all creation who formed us in our mother's womb. We said, we're going to do it our way. And guess what? Jesus loved us so much And it's so much his nature to be full of honor that he honored us with his very life so that we could be redeemed and walk in the fullness of all he formed us for. So maybe since he has so honored us, we could honor somebody else who doesn't deserve it either. I just wonder what the impact, what the impact of the people of God could be if we learn to honor even when we didn't want to. If we could learn to honor even when we thought they don't deserve it. Remember what we said earlier, that honor is recognizing that those with whom we interact, every person is someone formed in the image of God, just like you are. They're a human being. Would you treat him like a human being? I started to say, some of you, I don't know what you do. I'm not on your Facebook feed. Some people I know who claim the name of Christ treat other people like dirt. What's up with that? What's up with that? If there's any place where people ought to be able to honor someone else as a human being formed in the image of God and valued by Christ at the cost of his life and worthy of love and service. If there's any group that ought to be able to do that, it ought to be us. And until the church figures that out, until the people of God begin to understand what it's like to extend honor to someone who maybe doesn't deserve it because Jesus extended honor to us when we didn't deserve it. Until the church figures that out, how is it ever going to change? Honor generously. You, You won't pour out too much honor. You hear me? You won't, 
be like my mama when she's fixing me a plate of food. Oh, you need a little more. Mama had all kept. No, here, here, just, you want some seconds? Here, here, you want to take this home? <laughs> what would it hurt? Are you going to lose because of it? Or do you think Jesus could come along and just do something so rich in the honor you extend that you'd end up being blessed because you showed honor in abundance, generously, where it might not have been deserved? Honor freely. Yeah, but you don't know what they said to me, did to me. No, but, and I don't really know what you did or said to Jesus either, but I know you haven't treated him well all along, all along the way. I'm going to wait for all the shouting to die down. Honor in agreement and in disagreement. Honor everyone. Everyone. Jesus, you know those places in our lives where we're disinclined to extend honor. And, and in my, I understand that. I understand. Where we've been mistreated, where we've been dishonored, where we feel threatened, where we feel like something significant is at risk. We're reluctant to honor. But you've told us to bless our enemies, to, to pray for those who spitefully use us so that we might indeed reflect that we are children of our Father in heaven. And in my heart and in my mind, I, I can imagine a world where the church graciously wisely, but generously offers honor where we recognize that people with whom we disagree, people who may even feel like they're a threat to us, that every person is someone you love as dearly as you've loved us, that your heart is for them and their future and your plan for them as much as your heart is for us and our future and your plan for us, that your love is all encompassing and your desire is that none should perish but that all should come to repentance. And God, as long as we're dishonoring, that's gonna to be tough to seek accomplished. But if we could be so bold and generous as to honor everyone, doesn't mean we have to agree God, if we could be so bold as to honor everyone, I wonder what you could do with a church like that. I wonder how Lawrence could be impacted as Anchor Church embraces a commitment to honor up, to honor down, to honor all around. Thank you that you've honored us with abounding love, sacrificial love, that when we stood opposed to you in our hearts, you kept loving us, you kept seeking us, you kept drawing us to yourselves. So we commit ourselves, Jesus, to honor all around, to the glory of your name and the advance of your purpose. I pray it in your matchless, strong name, amen.